Howdy, Joe Straczynski here. Uh, some of you may be wondering why it has taken a while to get this new commentary video uploaded. And the reason for that is that your humble correspondent, yours truly, uh, is an idiot. <laughs> Allow me to explain. Um, a while back, a couple of few weeks ago, I went in to get a haircut. Not a big deal, particularly in my case where there's much to work with. But I went in and my usual hair cutter and she said at the end of the process, have you considered doing a gray blending? Now, I didn't know what that actually meant. I assumed it was something that would just like take the gray down a notch. So it wouldn't be quite so frightening. So I said, sure, why not? Why not? I've never done it before. Let's go for it. It wasn't until we were well into the process and beyond the point of no return that I discovered she meant die job. So I came out of the process looking like that guy in the police lineup, not her fault, just the way I am, a guy in the police lineup right before somebody yells out, that's him, that's the one, he did it. So I've been waiting for this to calm down. You should have seen it. No, you shouldn't have seen it. But trust me, had you seen it, you wouldn't have wanted to see it the day that I came out. doesn't matter. Point is, I've been waiting for this to kind of go down and back here and all the rest of it. And it's taking a long time. So I decided to bite the bullet, which I keep in the other room. I, I just, it's my biting bullet. I bite the bullet whenever I feel the need to inflict more pain on myself than I already have. And to this video anyway. So by the time you see me next, you will be seeing me as I usually am, gray haired, white haired, whatever you want to call it, and not with all this going on. So um, with that early statement out of the way, um, let us get into the current episode for our commentary today, which is In the Shadow of Zaha Doom, which is a pivotal episode on a lot of different levels. Uh, so we're doing, as you know already, a sync up video. No syncs are required, it's S-Y-N-C. So I have the remote in hand. When I push go, you push go, and we will go through the episode together. Ready? I'm not, let's do this, okay. Three, two, one, press. I think that was a new establishing shot. We didn't really have that one before, I don't think. Um, So we have the Narn War going on, and actually the, the Narns who were going through this doorway to save on prosthetics, they came in that door, around the back, and came back through again. So it's really the same, like, 15 guys going through the, the thing every time. Um, where this episode came from, I worked on a lot of shows, and invariably you cannot take your nominal hero, your nominal good guy, too far down a rocky road and make them make decisions that are of dubious moral or legal val validity. And I wanted to do that with Sheridan. I wanted to put him in a position where he had an emotional truth that was valid that drove him down a very bad road. This is one of my favorite scenes in, in the show, oddly enough, when Veer comes to Morden. Because I've always seen Veer as kind of to use a medieval term, God's fool. He can walk up to the most terrifying things, whether it's a techno mage with a demon or Mr. Morton, and say and do remarkable things, um, and yet emerge unscathed for the most part. He is that innocent in a, a sea of jerks <laughs> and users and abusers and horrible people to walk through it all and not be destroyed by it. Uh, the dynamic here with Morton, I think, is great because Ed Wasser was playing it like, I've never had someone say no to me before, and that's happening, and I don't like it. It's not since he got into his deal with the shadows. I love that it's, for Veer, it's not about the political necessity of saving the Centauri Republic. That's a political requirement. That's a <sighs> cultural imperative. But there are certain ethical points that are beyond convenience, 
that should not be considered in making certain decisions. And because of that, he's, he's free enough to say no and put Morden in a very awkward position where he gets told no. And I like that a great deal about this particular scene. Going back to the earlier point, um, Bruce did an amazing job in this show of playing, and there's the wave. Uh, we see it later on. Uh, on various sites, I said, remember that wave, you're going to see it again down the road. Bruce always plays the very straightforward, <clears throat> um, unflappable, good guy who plays by the rules, or maybe he fudges a little bit, but ultimately he is a good guy. But I asked the question, dear viewer of you, if you had lost someone dear to you and believed there were no survivors and found someone who did survive and might have had something to do with the event that took away your loved one, what would you do? Or perhaps more to the point, what would you not do? And that's where we take Sheridan. Bruce loved the chance of, to take his role and take his skills right to the very far edge of what he could get away with. Um, and it's a great opportunity to also explore the idea that nobody's wrong and everybody's wrong and everyone's right and nobody's right. Uh, in acting out his emotional truth, Sheridan is right. He, he, he can't let this guy go. And what Ger Garibaldi does later on, he's acting out his truth, which is there are laws, there are rules. And pitting those two against each other, for me as, as a writer, that's kind of the fun of the whole thing. That's, that's when you play around in a situation where there is not a clear-cut yes or no answer, good, good or bad, where you can play around, that's the fun. The fun part for me, as, I'm, as you know, I'm rebooting Babylon 5. I'm fairly well along that process. And I remember the fun of the show is asking questions and posing moral dilemmas, causing bar fights wherever humanly possible. And that's a good thing about science fiction. It allows you to do those things. Uh, in, in a, let's say, a hospital procedural, it's will the guy get better or not. In a, um, a police show, it's will they get the bad guy before he sets off the bomb with a school bus full of kids? Probably yes. But science fiction allows you to go beyond the obvious and ask questions about who we are as humans, where we're going, what does life mean, what is, what is a right and ethical decision and what is not. And it is also, parenthetically, the only authentically, intrinsically optimistic genre there is. It's the only genre that says there will be a tomorrow. It may not be the best of all possible tomorrows, but the human race goes on. So that's why I've always been always drawn to science fiction for storytelling purposes. It just, for someone like me who likes process, who likes figuring out how things happen, uh, who likes exploring the big questions, it's the ideal, the ideal form. I think I may have mentioned before, um, uh, Ed Wasser started off with us as a script reader in the room with actors where um, we would bring in actors and to audition and he would read with them and he did this for the pilot and we gave him a small role but then brought him out for the series and we were looking for someone to play Mr. Morton and whenever we put him in a room with someone who was auditioning for that role he always sounded more like Morton than the guy playing Morton and if I said let's you know let's cast him, cast him because he's the right choice and he did such a really terrific job with this uh, this is where Sheridan loses his mind and goes on to his journey. When he decides, shut down everything, shut the station down, we don't let this guy out. He's already crossed the line just by shutting down the station. Yeah, Ministry of Peace, um, they called it, you know, unofficially mini packs. It wasn't the actual name of it. Um, 
and Night Watch were things that I really wanted to explore as the notion that, you know, fascism, when it comes, and it comes a lot when you're not looking, always rides in on the wings of, let us help you, let us make you safe, let us create an environment where the troublemakers are rounded up, where you are assured, where you are peaceful and you are safe. And we've seen that happen so many times, and we're seeing it most recently happening locally. There is no such thing as guarantees of security or safety. Um, and people tend to look for lies where, you know, courage is not required. And unfortunately, that's not possible. Um, I mentioned earlier on process. And as I mentioned recently online, uh, I, I love exploring like how wars start and how um, societies change and what makes them change and what comes out the other end. And with the main story of Babylon 5, I wanted to explore how a war starts, how we get into a war, what it means, and where it goes. But the more subtle part is exploring social movements and how fascism comes into play. Uh, we saw it in, in a big way in the 1950s where McCarthyism and the House of American Activities Committee came in and terrorized the entire country on the premise of keeping us safe. Um, that there were unnamed, unspecified people with, with evil intent. There were communists in the military and politics. They never named them, of course. They didn't have any names. They couldn't you know, provide any proof. That was the important part. The part was bringing them before Congress in ways that forced them to either turn on their fellows, as we had, as we had happened with um, the, the Hollywood 12, who refused to name names of the people who were also communists, or at one time belonged to a party because they wanted to get dates. And to transplant that process here with Ministry of Peace and that watch. Um, we again see more of Morden starting to get rattled because he has been able to go and come as he wants and tries to actually blow past Zach and discovers that it's not going to work out to his benefit. Uh, up until now, Ed only had to play a very smug guy passing on orders and, and information from his masters. But now, it's the other way around. He's, now he's in a bind. We've, this is actually scripted. And the, the reason I said that, he's sitting in his, in a, at a table, his feet up, kind of in Morden's face. I assumed it would be a larger table than we actually had, because uh, the, the table we shot in is like about you know, that big. Um, and so his feet are even more in, in Morden's face. It's, it's really an insult, you know. Um, yeah, there is the table, so a little bit on the tiny side. Um, and... Usually, you know, we have Sheridan talking a great deal, and I think he's at his most dangerous when he's not talking, when he's past talking. That's, that's the hard part. Um, the photograph of the um, young woman in the, uh, 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 who was Anna Sheridan was someone we just sort of, you know, grabbed for the picture, and we always meant to go back after we cast someone else to play that role later on in, in, real, in the real world, but never had a chance to quite make it work because it was a moving picture and we couldn't mat it in properly. I love his technique here of just not saying much to Morden because he's letting Morden go wherever he wants to go and see how much he's prepared to say on his own before he actually starts interrogating him. Just that cold, steely look, you know, and the nervousness that's starting to come into Morden. You just, you just you tell he's lying. And we actually had live cameras going in the room. So when you see him in the, on the monitor there, that's not a pre-record. That's actual cameras that are situated in the room feeding in his, uh, his image to the screens. <laughs> this shoves a table into his midsection. And it's really a, 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 a contest of wills between them to see how far each of them is prepared to go. And when Morden says, you have to charge you with something, he's not wrong. 
He, he can't just hold something because. But that's exactly what Sheridan plans to do. And that takes our lead character down a very dark road. And the question becomes, how long will he stay on that road and what will get him off of it? If this were a different show and our hero was in that room and said, you don't exist, you're not alive, there's no one to miss you, um, we're going to do whatever we want to you, you would take that as being our antagonist. You take that as being our, our bad guy. Um, and that's, again, the fun of the, the role reversal on this. I've often said in the past that when I write a story and it isn't working, I turn it upside down. And when you turn Sheridan as a hero upside down, what do you get? And because you got to play colors he doesn't normally play, uh, and, and tones and textures, Bruce loved this part. It was exhausting for him because he had to go to places that he doesn't normally go. Um, and spend basically the entire week being angry. Uh, you, you be an actor and spend you know, seven days shoot being angry every day. Uh, it's exhausting, but um, God, he does a great job in this episode. This is kind of where we start um, uh, Richard Biggs and Dr. Franklin's arc of putting himself on the line too much and working too hard, and uh, which leads to the whole STEM story because you know a lot of doctors end up with addiction problems. They are too stressed out. They work too long hours. They need to stay up and keep working, and uh, it's not uncommon. And he is someone who likes to save lives, and he can't do that unless he's actually, you know, aware and awake and doing what he has to do. I believe that this is where we get into, um, yeah, the foundation of this thing. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't want to become another L. Ron Hubbard. But when I worked out the, what the foundation is, my question was one of consciousness. Uh, is consciousness centered in the body or as some Mimbari others think, is it somewhere else and it comes through us? In other words, you know, the, a radio does not create the music you're hearing. It just picks it up from somewhere else. And is that who and what we are? Um, quantum physics tells us that the universe came into existence, everything, with the Big Bang, but they don't know what caused the Big Bang. There's like some background signal, background noise before it happened, but they can, they can tell you what happened, but they can't tell you why it happened. The foundationists believe that what happened was consciousness. If the universe brings into being, there's no one there to perceive it, does it really happen? And if, if on a quantum level, the observer affects the observed, if you look at something and it's a, a wave, look, wait, like a wave, look away, it's a particle, look back and it's a wave again, then we know that consciousness affects the material world. And what if consciousness is simply another form of energy, not spiritual energy, not that, not that stuff, but like, you know, a, a cosmic rays or gravity. It is simply a natural force that embeds everything. From, you know, I mean, animals have consciousness. They may not have sentience, but they have consciousness. And if consciousness drives everything, then perhaps at some point down the road, if it is indeed a natural force, like gravity or cosmic rays or what have you, then we might be able to actually measure it. It seems like a silly idea now, but then so was, you know, being able to measure gravity. So was being able to, you know, perceive things outside the normal range of human spectrum. So that's where the foundation comes from. It is a notion that consciousness created the universe and now it is part of that universe and trying to understand itself. First person who was a temple to this is going to hear from my attorneys. Sheridan has seen, um, you know, playing the interrogator just jumping in on him with every single question. Uh, God, the intensity is just so great. And, and on one level, Morton is, is arrogant, but he's started to break a little bit. Um, he's, 
He knows he's protected, but that doesn't st stop him from being, you know, the recipient of Sheridan's rage. And he doesn't know how far Sheridan's prepared to go. Uh, will he just pull out a gun and shoot him? Doubtful, because he needs more than a life to be able to say this is what happened. But can he bet on that? Maybe, maybe not. I love this, just, you know, how peaceful it is, how well he talks. It's all about protecting Earth and protecting our own people and creating a system to make sure that, you know, things don't go wrong. And, yeah, I picked the armband as the, as the obvious symbol of, you know, Nazis. But by the same token, it's not, you know, exclusive to them. We do have other organizations that wear armbands that are much more civilized, everything from the Red Cross, um, uh, military police wear them. It, it's, not, it's, not what, it's not wearing an armband that's necessarily fascistic, although it can be. It's what it says. It is, and it's also the first step in separating you from those around you. It's a way of instilling fear and terror and intimidation to those who see you. It's a way of uh, uh, creating a sense of superiority and rank. I have this and you don't. Uh, and once you put it on, you are now separate and apart from the rest of your own, you know, civilization and society. And once you are separate, once you are apart, it becomes easier to do things that you might not normally do because you are among them, but you are no longer of them. Uh, so not just goes from safety and actions to misinformation, to attitudes, to thought police. Uh, because troublemakers proceed from, they think that the government's a bad thing, and that's, that's dangerous. That's it's dangerous and it's wrong because the government is, is here for all of us. And by golly, we're here to, to help them. We're going to fix them. Like the, uh, the, the, the North Korean sunshine camps where they put people in for re-education. And now we see the, um, the fracture starting. And as I mentioned before, the fun thing is that in this conversation, they are both right in their own way. And Garibaldi's right, when he, he does play it loose when he has to, but there are lines that he has to draw. And Sharon's not about, I'll take full responsibility. That's, again, how fascism works, and, or, or that's how terrible things happen, is if someone says, I'll take responsibility, that, 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 that's like Pat saw in the Trump thing, I'll take responsibility, you just do what you're going to do. Uh, in a gag reel, by the way, when uh, he points to the, the monitor and says, does he look you know, dead to you, Ed Wasser falls over. Um, when someone else takes responsibility, it, it's, we abdicate our own, and then we can, again, do whatever we have to do. And we now establish it's been 10 hours, 10 hours that Sheridan has been talking to this guy nonstop. He's also right when he says that interpreting an order, for officers orders is grounds for mutiny. So they're both throwing rules at each other, but they're both right and they're both wrong. And when you are in the military, if you are in any position of power, if you are being forced to do something that you don't want to do, your only ethical response is to quit. That's why whenever I hear someone, you know, say, well, I had to, I was following orders. No, there's no such thing as had to. You always have the power, whether it's in a corporation, an organization, a political organization, a military, to say, I will go this far and no further. You have the obligation to say no. You have the obligation to walk away. And that's what Garibaldi does here. Which is why he turns to Zach later on, because Zach isn't quite as strong in his position as Garibaldi. Um, he is used to following orders. He hasn't been sitting in that chair where Sheridan is now, having to make hard decisions about what is and is not appropriate. If Sheridan would give him an order, he would just follow the order. 
So here he has someone in, in, in Zach who is used to doing what he's told to do. And to a degree, he's taking advantage of that. And of course, he doesn't realize that in interrogating Morden, he is pushing down on a nerve that he doesn't know was there and endangering the larger cause. The similarity later on we mentioned in, in Coventry is, is quite, um, quite apparent. And here he begins to get a sense of how broad the conspiracy really is. That, you know, Morden is involved with Londo and others are now moving in to protect him. And the more that they, of course, insert themselves into that process, the more it raises the question, why? Why are you so insistent? Who is this guy? You know, an hour before, he was just one guy who survived a terrible thing that happened. But now suddenly ambassadors are coming to talk about him. That's, uh, that says that this goes deeper, that the rabbit hole goes a lot deeper than he thought it did. It's a diplomatic community that, that sends him right over the edge. And it really wouldn't work. It's hard to extend that to a person you know, who is not Centauri, but um, the fact that he, they would even try and pull this off is uh, bad. And I don't think Veer here really understood the details of it. And you can tell from his attitude, it's a distasteful job for him. He doesn't really want to be here. He isn't actually forcing the conversation too hard. The, um, the scene where Talia is used to sort of um, deal with uh, Morden goes to the notion of, you know, taking interrogation to a whole new level. And it's that willingness to go as far as he has to go and one step beyond that now puts him out as not only with Garibaldi, but with, with Ivanova. Because she's right, she has an obligation to report this if indeed he's going to go all the way. The second CO does have, a, you know, the XO in this case, have an obligation, as everyone else does, if they see their CO acting in ways that are inappropriate or dangerous, to stop them. And if necessary, relieve them of duty. And if, this, if he didn't pull it off, he didn't stop doing this at some point, that would have to happen. And here you really sense his desperation and his loss. We've had him talk about Anna, but we haven't really seen that grief before. Now we see it. Now we see how hurt he is by this, and that that grief has come out now as rage, blind rage. And the question he asked is the question that we asked the audience, and, and I'm asking you, could, could you do it? Could you walk away? He has all this power, and, and he's going to use it to the best of his ability to get the answers that he needs. Again, looking at rules, everyone using the rules in their own way. Um, well, that's the scene where he points at, at Morton, pardon me, and um, in, the, in the daily he falls over dead. Um, the side core has rules about scanning. Uh, and what he's saying about using the, the letter of the law to speak the, spirit, to speak the spirit of the law, that's what he's been doing from day one on this. Um, she has to follow the rules. Psychor says no unauthorized scans. It cannot be allowed to happen. And he, now he's trying to subvert her, her rules. He subverted the rules of command, subverted the rules of the security division, tried to subvert you know, the, the command structure, tried to subvert the, um, the, the Psychor rules. Uh, where does it stop? If you are convinced you are right, and you are convinced that the cause is necessary, how far will you go? And here Zach gets a sense of where this is going, but he doesn't have the, the experience to say no. And 
And he senses something's wrong. He doesn't know what it is, but something is wrong. And this begins to really sort of drill in the, the, the ability of the telepaths to perceive the shadows. Uh, there's a connection between telepaths and the shadows. We've sort of hinted at it here and there. Uh, I mentioned that the Narn telepaths were wiped out um, in that war. But now we see, now as he's breaking the rules, he's hurting other people in the process. And that's, that's the really dangerous part of the whole thing. In this scene, um, uh, Andrea Thompson really got caught up in the moment and in the emotion of it. And when, when she slaps Sheridan, she slaps Bruce. I mean, hard. Um, you could hear that. The, for the first, this is the first take when she did it. She pulled back in the later ones, but she was so caught up in the moment. Um, she spun his head around really hard. So we definitely were sure to use this particular take because uh, it watches a reaction. This is great. And you see how his hair gets rocked back? You don't normally see that in television. They, they either go past it in the, in the foreground or they just do a light tap to figure out. But she hit him hard enough to, to shake the hair on the top of his head. Uh, he wasn't acting. That was, that was some pretty severe <laughs> a slug he took there. Um, she felt very badly about it afterward. I was just caught in the moment. But, so, and this is all one take, by the way, if you haven't noticed that. Uh, we, 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 you know, there were other takes that actually had a little bit better performance, but boy, that slap made it worthwhile. And you know, Franklin's right, is just, you know, we think we're alone. When things like this happen, when there's tragedy or trauma or grief, we think we're alone. We think that no one understands what we feel and that there is no one who we can turn to. And that's where the terrible things can happen. And he needs her to understand, no, you're not alone. And practically on cue, that you're not alone, appear to land in Kosh to insert themselves into the process. And what's interesting, <clears throat> not often brought up about this whole sequence, is that when Kosh sort of beams the visuals into Sheridan's head later on, it kind of raises the question, how did they get those visuals? Was Zaha Doom under surveillance? Um, there were probably rumors that things were going on, um, which is why the land went to Kosh in the first season uh, for Chrysalis to say, you know, have the shadows returned to Zahadum? And that's when he says yes. Um, but that all happened <clears throat> after the Icarus really kind of woke them up. I give poor Mayor so many speeches about billions of years ago, thousands of years ago. And uh, I would envy that, and I, I probably should have made these speeches a little bit shorter. But I kind of liked the storytelling of the mythology in the background. I love that Sheridan's like, so what, I don't care about any of this. What does this have to do with, with my situation? You see, he's been getting restless. This is the first time we really learned what the first ones were, and that Kosh is among them. Uh, some of the others who walk at them, Sigma 957, are also first ones who are just kind of sticking around or passing through. This also goes to the legends of gods fighting each other, and every mythology has at some point or other that um, wise and ancient beings preceded us, but they were always battling with each other. So she goes from billions of years ago, to 10,000 years ago, to 1,000 years ago, to now. It's like, here's a, here, I have all the notes on how this all worked, and you're going to pay for it. When you do, do too much world building for your own good. 
when I said when I had her say there's still one of them left, um, and they look at Kosh, some people took that to mean, oh, that Kosh is the only first one still around. That wasn't the intent. It was that he belongs to a civilization that is the one that is still around. And we said the mystery of how can be recognized by everyone. Of course, we answer that later on. So when the projection starts of what happened to the Icarus, which of course, for those of you who know the Greek mythology, Icarus went too close to the sun and his wings melted and was destroyed. Um, and I think the name of the ship, the Icarus, whatever tragedy comes your way, you more or less deserve. Um, so the fact that she's able to essentially narrate what he is seeing means that she has also seen that footage. Uh, and that relationship was something that, that we didn't explore in detail here, but there was always a part of my head that said we can go back and figure out just how much Kosh knew, where, when, and how they got that material. Now we begin to pull all the threads together, Jakar, Zahadum, the shadows, now it all comes together. See, if, it, if we hadn't done the light into his eyes, he would just think this is only a flashback. But because he is getting a projection, that means the Vorlons saw the Icarus go by. They have a record of it, they have a record of it landing and people coming out. Um, the Vorlons see a lot of stuff, uh, but I figured that once the shadows were fully awake, they would have found and destroyed all those um, recording devices and systems for surveillance. I mean, logically, if you knew that they might come back at some point, you would put in a burglar alarm. And they did. And it went off. And went off when that showed up on their scanners. The original scene I had in mind in my head was the, the city like rising up out of the ground and all these shells come boiling up like beetles up out of the ground. But um, we can only afford to do one. And there's the question. <clears throat> Those who could not serve were killed. And again, Sheridan is not wrong. Uh, and Delenn doesn't address the question of is Anna Sheridan alive or not. She just jumps past that to, you know, we have to let it more go. But once again, Sheridan's right. Anna is still alive, and we find that out much later. Full points to, to Mira for carrying this scene. There's just a ton of exposition here that has to be delivered in a way that makes it convincing not just to the audience, but to Sheridan himself. Uh, to make him understand what's at stake. And then that becomes, interestingly enough, the same parallel to what Jakar has to deal with. For Sheridan to do what's right for the war, he has to let go of his rage. If he doesn't, it all goes to hell. Similarly, in Dust to Dust and elsewhere, Jakar has to understand that if he doesn't let go of his rage, their war against the Centauri was just going to turn into a nonstop cycle of death. Um, coming from a family where there was just always rage and violence, um, something about the, the sanctity of solemn thought, the willingness to set aside our anger for something better is kind of important to me. And that tends to go through a lot of my work, including here. And usually in science fiction, everyone knows the history of the, the past. I wanted to make sure that, that Zach actually didn't know. And this story, uh, there's some dispute back and forth about how accurate it is, but most historians agree that um, the Coventry story is exactly what happened, that Churchill 
got word that they were going to evac evacuate Coventry, uh, the Nazis were going to strike Coventry, and he had the option of evacuating them and revealing that they had the information, which would mean they would change the codes and they'd be screwed, or letting Coventry be bombed. And uh, he made the hard choice. I'm not sure, you know, if another person could have made that choice. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I'm just saying it was a hard choice. I think Bruce is just so great in this episode. It goes from, from the anger, to the thoughtfulness, to the really kind of resignation that you see in him. Um, it's... Actors often get typecast as one kind of role or the other, whether it's the hero or the bad guy or what have you. But the reason it happens is that they're just really, really, really good actors. And, you know, Bruce always gets, I won't say stuck, but gets hired to do these, you know, square-jawed, which actually he is kind of square-jawed, uh, uh, by-the-book heroic guys. But give him something else to play. Give him something dark to play and give him something mournful to play. And he does a terrific job of it. We were very fortunate to have him, and, and, and Jeff in this scene also, in this episode. We we're bringing him up, we give him some small things to do earlier on, but we're bringing him up further and further, and uh, giving Jeff a chance to, to shine and show his ability uh, was really a, a reward for all of us because he was just rebuilding his career after firebombing and overtaxing. And he really just, he brought it, you know. He really has this vulnerability and this likability that um, sells the character and sells the role really well. I like though that Sheridan is still not 100% sure he wants to do this or if it's right until they run the scan and he actually sees them for just a second. He's an empirical kind of guy. He wants some small evidence that this is the right thing to do before he makes that, that, final, step, that final step. Shadows. <clears throat> but once he has that in hand, once he knows the truth, he really has no choice. He then becomes the officer that we know him to be. This is what has to be done. Let's just do it. It's as hard as breaking, but the moment it's proven, what else can he do? He has to go along with what they asked. Let this guy go. Looks like a python in that shot. Not Monty Python, like an actual python. I have no idea what Jerry is eating in that scene. They had a great chemistry, at least, too. They really worked together well. And there was a period where, <clears throat> um, when Jerry and Andrea went their separate ways, um, Jerry was living at um, Bruce's house for a long time, <laughs> while well, he looked for something else to do. Then he lived with Andreas, at Andreas Katsoulis' house for a while. He kind of did a lot of couch surfing on this show. And now you see the armband coming in, and you know, these things are always incremental. They get the person to agree to a small thing, and it's fine. A cults do the same thing. And another fine thing, another small thing. And by the time they realize they're doing big, wrong things, they have come so far down that road that they have a hard time going back again. So that means that all those other decisions have to be now taken back. I love here that, that, that Sheridan does not just go along with this to go along with this. It's, he wants something back. And now we begin to make Sheridan more than he was before by virtue of the fact that he's not just going to you know, run a station, he's going to have a larger destiny, he's going to Zaha Doom. He's going to learn how to fight legends. 
And that's the point where I think a lot of fans got really galvanized. They began to see the scope and the scale of the show being much more than they thought it was going to be. My favorite line here. I will not go down easily and I will not go down alone. When I used to go on walks in San Diego to try and find the guys who jumped me that time and try to beat me to death. Um, and someone said, so what if you find them, what happens? That's actually what I said in response. Uh, I won't go down easily, I won't go down alone. So that was in the shadow of Zaha Doom. Um, a terrific, fun little episode, a lot of fun for me to write, a lot of fun for, for Bruce to um, take part in. So, um, cool little show. Thank you for joining me. Apologies for the delay. This will be back to normal soon. And I will see you on the flip side. Stay out of trouble.